Why don't you stand with us? We're going to praise his name this morning, lift it up in song, and give him all the glory today. Good morning to you. Is this on? Yeah. Okay, good. Good to see you. Good to have you here. We got a great service, and and uh, you're going to enjoy it. I'm certain of that. Uh, if you don't, you have to stay after until you finally say, "I enjoyed that service." Oh, so. <laughs> Can you believe that there are some places that hold people prisoner? <laughs> we won't do that. Hey, but, but I, I do want you to know that God is on the throne, and God has an incredible plan for each one of our lives, and God wants us to begin to experience him up close and personal on a day-by-day -day basis. And so one of the things that we're going to uh, talk about in coming weeks, not, not today, but in coming weeks, we're going to talk about growing our relationship with the Lord. Uh, it's such a critical thing that we do that. So we're, we're going to uh, 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 mentor you on that sort of stuff, and, and, and uh, I think it'll, it'll help, help you uh, grow to be the person that Christ wants you to be. How many of you want to be the person Christ wants you to be? Absolutely, yeah. Well, I'm going to pray, and then uh, 
uh, we're going to continue on with our service. Father, we thank you that you are the Lord God Almighty. And Lord, you have a perfect plan for each one of our lives. Lord, there are some values and some behaviors that some of us need to make an adjustment in before you can reveal what you want. But Lord, we're on that target. We're on that road. We're, we're, we're on the road to being transformed by your Holy Spirit. Continue working in us, Lord. We give you thanks for that. And we ask that you would bless our service today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Take about 30 seconds and, and meet someone, greet them, and we'll call you right back. 30 seconds. About 25 to go. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Let's go, Lisa.
just thank you for our children, amen? We thank you for the future of worship here at Generations Church. Thank you, Lord God. We're going to learn a new song today. You guys ready?
Can we get our own microphones today? That could be dangerous. We don't get our own microphones? Oh, darn it. That's no fun. I see how she's taking it away. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she's uh, smart. Uh, no. <laughs> very, very wise. Good morning, everybody. Wow, everybody looks wide awake after losing an hour of sleep last night. That's pretty good. Yeah, I'm not. Anyhow, good morning again. Um, I'm Bill. This is Cynthia, my wonderful wife. We're your pastor's assistants and going to be going over some very, very important information. So pay attention. Pay attention. Eyes up here. No one's paying attention. Okay. Anyhow, uh, welcome card. Please fill this out. Um, very important. Um, just put your name and all your information in the front. It's very, very important. And if you want to, uh, you know, serve or get connected, there's some things down here you can check and, and drop in the offering basket at the end of the service. Most importantly, prayer requests on the back, and everybody has prayer requests, so um, expect a card from each and every person at the end of service in the basket, right? Or you can do it online at visitchurch.net. Same thing if you don't want to write, don't know how, but you know how to type. I can't write anymore. You can't read my writing, so that's a good thing. Yeah, love computers. Anyhow, ooh, keep hitting that. Yeah. Um, your offering envelope for offering and, offering and tithes. Um, this is what, if this is your home and this is your church, please, this is what you uh, give your offerings and tithes in at the end of the service. Drop this in the basket. Um, you can also specify where you want your tithe to go on here. Just check the little boxes, yada, yada, yada. You know the, you know the drill. Anyhow, moving along, um, there will be no men's Monday night fellowship this week. Um, come join everybody next week, next Monday. I know there's a bunch of men that get together and they have a great time. Great, yeah, Bob, woohoo, yeah, Bob's here. Um, for fun and fellowship and all that, but um, nothing tomorrow. It'll be a week from tomorrow. So if you show up tomorrow, you'll be here all alone, right? That might not be bad. Oh, you're taking the mic now? Okay. It's because I'm hungry. You're hungry? I want a hot dog. You want a hot dog? You want a hot dog? I want a hot dog. You want a hot dog? You want a hot dog? Hey, hot dog here! <laughs> <laughs> Come to Saturday, I take here hot dogs and bingo. Hot dogs and bingo this Saturday from five to eight. Five bucks? Five bucks. And you get a whole plate? Wow. Pastor Jim's coming? He said so. We're going to buy two tickets or four. It's 29. 29. Okay. Wow. Ooh, professional. And then we also have a professional guy to cook the hot dogs. He's coming for the hot dogs. Is he going to wear the hot dog suit? No. Oh. I'm hungry. And all that food has been purchased so far using a bunch of money that we're raising with your recycling. Make sure you're bringing your cans and bottles and leaving them at the Fellowship Hall. If you come during the week and you can leave them over here outside the Fellowship Hall, I'll bring them in for you. Uh, we raised how much, Dad? $187. $187. And remember, all the money that we raise for outreach is helping people that are in need. Okay, so you're just giving away your trash. That's not a lot to ask. Don't be lazy. Bring your trash. All right? Our trash? Yeah, because you don't, what are you going to do with the cans and bottles? Oh, Nothing. Just the cans. Nothing. Long, okay. I know. Isn't he a hot dog? So, Renew Bible Study, um, starting a new track called Not a Fan. It's by Kyle Eidelman. That's going to start up again this Tuesday in a couple of days at Mason and Lisa's house. If you have any questions, Mason's not in the back. Come and see Bill. Bill can answer your questions. He knows where they live. I do. I stalk them. I know. Okay, so um, 
Also, if you are looking to get out of debt and you want to live a debt-free life, get your finances in order, if you could please see Pastor Jim or give us a note on the back of your welcome card or on the front somewhere on there so that Jim can contact you. We're looking to find out how many people are interested. It's going to just be like a night or two meeting together, going over how to get into control, under control of your finances, okay? If you're a teen or you'd like to be a teen chaperone, I hear they need those too sometimes, there is the Night of Champions. That's an, it's a really great thing. They go every year down at APU. That's coming up on March 23rd. The cost is only $10. And there's going to be awesome music. If anybody here has ever heard of Francis Chan, um, he's a great minister and writer, and uh, he's going to be speaking there. So if you want to be a teen chaperone, you won't be missing out on much, I can tell you that. Um, I think that's all that we have to say today. So I think it's up to Pastor Jim to help save our lives. Okay. Thank you. And welcome again. Good to see you all. And uh, uh, we're going to fasten our seat belts and uh, hear something that uh, I think will help us at the end of the day. So that's what we're going to shoot at. Now before I get going in, into the message though, uh, in, in the next couple of weeks and over the next couple of weeks, we're going to uh, more than ever before begin to invite you to become a part of one, one of our uh, small groups. Uh, uh, we have a group that uh, works on marriages and they talk about the dynamics of marriage and, and their marriages are growing. Uh, we have groups that, uh, well, a men's group that they just get to kick around some biblical concepts and how it applies to our lives. We've got all kinds of stuff going on. And, and so we're going to be asking you to uh, start taking a look at it in the next two weeks and, and, and uh, commit yourself to being in uh, one of the groups. One of the things that we're, uh, we've found out and we're pretty committed to is that people grow in their relationship with other people in circles more than they do in rows. When we, when we get together, we get in a circle, we look each other in the eye, we share our life with them, we grow, they grow, everyone lives happily ever after, and they drink coffee at the same time. So, I mean, what could be better than that? Uh, and, and so we're going to be asking you to do that and, and be a part. The other thing we're going to be asking you to do is, is uh, uh, alter a bit of your Sunday morning going to church time so that you can go into the fellowship hall and, and, and hear uh, the, the four things that we're, we're working on that will make us a, a, a more effective church, a better church, reach more people, that kind of thing. Uh, and, and so ultimately, we're going to be asking all of us to uh, sit and go through those classes. And, and you, you'll learn so much, and we'll be better equipped to uh, minister to people who are not in Christ yet. So, so be watching for that, be open to that, and uh, we, we'll, we'll just continue to give some guidelines on that. Uh, I'm so delighted that you're here today because we're going to uh, kind of pick up where we, we left off last week. We started a series, My Big Fat Mouth, and we talked about the problem of complaining. And, and I don't know about you, but I went home uh, last Sunday uh, realizing that I complained more than I thought I did. I thought I was like a small-time, uh, you know, just... I find out that I a lot of a lot of complaining going on over here. So I, I mean, did you find that out for yourself? Or uh, and, and and today we're going to be talking about a different concept, not quite as uh, admirable as being a, a, a one who complains a lot, but we're going to be talking about criticism. And uh, when, when I say we're going to talk about criticism, I'm not talking about the type of criticism you get from uh, your parents as you're growing up and your school teachers and, and your coaches and, and all of these people who are in our lives at various points in time. Uh, they, they, they are shaping us. They're not criticizing us. They are shaping us to be the person that God created us to be. 
But that, that's a good kind of, uh, of talking. But the other side of it, uh, being critical, uh, that's what destroys people's lives. And one of the interesting things is a lot of people uh, use uh, uh, that as an alibi. They, they, they hurt someone with harsh words that they say, and then they try to uh, camouflage it by, by saying, well, you know, it's because I love you that I told you that. Uh, no, you, you, if you told something painful to someone, uh, you said it on purpose to get the result that they were pained because of that. Uh, that's just kind of the human nature. Uh, and, and so we're, we're going to talk about uh, th- this whole concept of, uh, of criticism. I'm calling our message Criticism 101, the uh, ground floor lesson here, that, that's going to help us uh, be more effective at what we do and how we uh, talk with people. So the, the type of criticism that I'm talking about is that critical, nitpicking, unkind, uninformed, cruel uh, criticism that so often goes on. Uh, how many of you have ever criticized someone before? Did you do it in front of them or behind their back? Both, probably. Uh, see, we, we're, we're all guilty uh, of, of criticism, and, and we, we tell people what we think they need to know to be a better person. And so we, we you know, so again, I, it's, I, I love you. That's why I'm doing this too. That's why I'm hurting your heart. Yeah, uh, that's love. Yeah, thank you. Count, count me out. Uh, but uh, so we're, we're, that's the type of criticism that we're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about some alternatives to that, to how we can be a person who says something that can be redemptive to a person's life, and they grow. So that, that's what we're, we're going to be talking about. So a lot of people uh, walk around and they say, yes, it's true. God has a wonderful plan for your life. And I have a wonderful plan for your life, too. So we we try to uh, control people by by a number of ways, but but certainly by placing ourselves as a self-appointed person to uh, help them get life right. One of the things that I have learned that I think is very key and very important, uh, uh, people respond when they're accepted. In places where they are accepted, they will, they will change their life. See, a person, if they know they are accepted, will change what you, what you are trying to train them in if they know that they are accepted. And so, and we, and so we'll touch on that again. We'll, we'll, we'll get that out. So here's what I want to do. <coughs> Excuse me. I want to uh, spend some time uh, sharing with you seven concerns or seven, five concerns the Holy Spirit has uh, uh, for you and for me. And so here's the, here's the first concern. Uh, I, I'm calling it love your neighbor as yourself. Th- th- this is a, such a key concept uh, that we, uh, we have to really uh, wrestle with this because the truth is this is a biblical concept, love your neighbor as yourself. But I would contend with you that the vast majority of people never quite get it right. The vast majority of people will, will love someone that they know, that they have some experience with, and that, that is helpful to them. But there's a whole sea of people and types of people that they, they have biases against and prejudices against. So are they loving their neighbor as a self? No. They're doing some very selective uh, changing. But that's not good enough. That's not enough to change. We, we have to make the decision that I am going to simply uh, love my neighbor. doesn't matter who they are. And, and, and so we have to work at that. It, you know, we can't just uh, quote a verse, say, okay, love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, got it. I, I'm good now. Because uh, there's a difference between the words that we read and the words that we act out. 
So we have to say, okay, I, I'm going to love my neighbor as myself, so I have to start loving individuals. I have to start loving uh, people groups. I've, I've shared over the years a couple of times that uh, a people group that is a bit intimidating to me. Well, in fact, at one time was like way intimidating to me, was hell's angels like uh, motorcycle riders with long beards and tattoos and probably a gun in their hip pocket and, and you know, just those kinds of things. Uh, and uh, I, 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 was, I was afraid of them. I, I just thought that they're the type of person, uh, in my own opinion, they're, they're the type of person who if you uh, cross them or insult them, they just pull out their gun, go bang, bang, and, and put it back and go on with life. And I don't know that that's true, but that's what I've always envisioned. And so I've been biased toward that. So I had to begin a project of accepting hell's angels kinds of people and, and, and valuing them and loving them like I love myself. The result is, is that I have a couple of people I know now who are hell's angels kinds of people. Uh, they, they got the long beard, they got the tats, they got the Harley Davidson, they, they got all of it. And, and uh, discovering they're not so bad after all. They're people. Sometimes a little rough around the edges, but they're people. So the, this whole concept of uh, loving your neighbor as yourself uh, has two components to it. We, we have to make that a decision that we're going to make. We're going to live our life that way. And that takes time and that takes effort and that takes intentionality so that it can become true to us that, yes, I love my neighbor as myself. It's not just words that I'm speaking. It is actions I'm taking, and my life is being transformed because of it. So we have to, if we're going to say we love our neighbor as ourselves, the evidence has got to be there. We, we, we can't say, well, well, you know, those people. <laughs> we, we have to have it, it laid out for us. So... Let's take a look at Galatians 5, verses 14 and 15. The whole law is summed up in a single command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you keep on biting and devouring each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So there's, there's this command again. Love your neighbor as yourself. Then he flips it and starts talking about if you keep on biting and devouring each other, you will destroy another person. So we have to make a, a double decision that we are going to be a person who loves their neighbor as themselves, and we're going to be a person who walks it out, that people who walk behind us can observe our life and says, there goes a person who loves their neighbor like themselves. That takes time. That takes intentionality. We need to uh, try to get there. Paul's, Paul says that if, if, if you love your neighbor as yourself, then you won't do the second half of, of the, the verse. And so they go together. Love your neighbor as yourself under the contention that, that you're not going to do any biting and devouring anymore. You're going to uh, be a person who causes other people to grow in their life and in their relationship with the Lord. Now, this, this is a, a, a real problem for some of us because critical words are potentially destroying the intimacy that you could have in your marriage. One of the problems with a lot of interpersonal relationships is the, the, the hurt that we have and we turn that toward our spouse. Or what, what if... Uh, your relationship with one of your children is building a wall between the two of you. See, if we're going to love our neighbor as ourselves, we have to live in such a way that we can 
love our neighbor as ourselves. We have to accept people the way they are. If if we can accept people the way they are, we can help them make the change they need to to make so they can be the person God God created them to be. Does that make sense? So so we're we're going to talk about about that a, a little bit some more. So what if these critical words are actually keeping you from sharing the goodness of Jesus. See, if, if you are a critical person, people are watching your life. So you're a critical person, you announce yourself as being a Christian. And someone who's watching you sees that you, they, they hear that you say, I'm, I'm a Christian, but they watch what you do. And if you're not loving them as you your, 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 love your neighbor as yourself, people are going to say Christianity doesn't work because this is an obvious scene in which that person doesn't love his neighbor like he says he does. So, so if, we, if we're going to say, I'm going to love my neighbor as myself, I have to be able to walk that out. It, it's not just rhetoric. It's not just a Bible verse. It is a statement of life and commitment and purpose that we're going to change the world one person at a time. And so we have to uh, come aboard on that kind of thing. Let's take a look at this verse, the Proverbs 12, 18. Reckless words pierce like a sword, but the tongue of the wise bring healing. So we see a, a dual thing here again. Reckless words pierce like a sword. That, we, we've done that before, perhaps all too many times. But the tongue of the wise brings healing. That's what we have to learn to do. We have to learn to be healing to people. We have to speak words that transforms their life and empowers them to be who they were created to be. So, some people make cutting remarks. Uh, my, how many of you ever had a grandma? I don't know if your grandmother ever said this to you or not, but my grandma used to say, we'd, we'd go see her. We lived in Orange County. She lived in 29 Palms, so it's not like, you know, for years she lived on the East Coast, but then, but uh, we'd go see her and she would say, Jim, is your phone not working? I said, no, my phone's working perfectly well. Well, she said, I would never know it because you haven't called me since you were here the last time. And I say to myself, and I'm probably not going to call you next time either. Uh, <laughs> I, I said that before I was a Christian. I wouldn't say that today. What I did want to say to my grandma one time, though, I, I, I wanted to say, oh, did you find out, did you hear that the telephone lines go both directions now? You can call from here to me. Concept. If we're going to say we love our neighbor, if we say we're going to be a Christ follower, we have to change how we live our lives. So here is uh, concern number two. Let no unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. Let's look at this verse, Ephesians 4, verse uh, 29. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. This is is huge. Uh, If you nail this verse down, by the way, this is our memory verse for the week. So if, if you nail this verse down, It'll change your life like very few other verses in the Bible will do. This is huge. Don't let any unwholesome word. That that word unwholesome uh, means uh, a couple of things. One of them uh, it means don't let any putrid words come out of your mouth. So you, you kind of get a graphic of that in your mind. What what does putrid words look like? Uh, uh, one of the, the meanings of that word unwholesome is don't let any venomous 
talk come out of your mouth? What, what is venom? That's like snake stuff that, that uh, highly uh, able to kill you. Don't let any venom, words that will kill you, don't let those kinds of words come out of your mouth. Only such a word that is helpful for building others up. When you let uh, unwholesome words come out, you're tearing people down. When you're, when you're uh, uh, helping people uh, by build, speaking words that build them up, then you're bringing life and renewal and restoration to them. You're helping them become a better follower of Jesus. You're, you're helping them even make the decision to come to faith in Christ in the first place. So, so we want to make sure that no unwholesome talk comes out of our mouths. Now, we rarely stop to consider this, but, but most of us have no idea how a single word can devastate someone and stay with them maybe for the rest of their lives. Words spoken that are cutting words destroy people's uh, self-identity, their, their, their stature, their, who they are. And, and that's, that's a, a, a terrible wrong to do to someone. So we, we want to make sure that we don't uh, do those kinds of words. And, and, and for the most part, most of us have no idea what a word of acceptance, a word of alliance with someone is such a huge thing that it elevates their self-esteem and suddenly they recognize that they are a person who has value, who, who can compete with anyone and, and uh, li live a life of, of redemption. So your words have power. Some people make uh, cutting remarks, but the words of the wise bring healing. Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. Say that out loud with me. Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of my mouth. If you would take that and, and, and make that a reality in your own life, that you're going to guard your mouth, that you're going to uh, determine what kind of words that you're going to speak. If you do that, it changes everything. This verse here will change your life if you will just uh, uh, respond to it. In fact, I would, I would encourage you to uh, go to verse uh, 29, 30, 31, and 32. You don't let any in a wholesome word come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs that may benefit those who listen. And, and, and don't uh, say words that destroy a person's identity. Verse 31 says, uh, and, and get rid of all anger and, and malice and, and those kinds of things. And verse 32 says, And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ has forgiven you. So, so that the, the, those verses are just loaded with the power of God and the anointing of God that if we were to get those in our spirit and, and live like that, it would make all the difference in the world. Our lives would be changed. Here's a question. You'll notice on your note sheet, what type of person do you want to be? A faith finder or a hope dealer? A, a, a fault finder, rather. See, there, there are people who go around not looking for what is right about someone or something. They go around looking at what is wrong. And that's what they focus on. They are the fault the, the fault. Uh, uh, kind of people where they just uh, look for what is wrong. Jesus comes along to that same environment and he speaks words of life. You know the difference between uh, a person who, who is a fault finder and a hope dealer is, is a fault finder speaks words that kill. A hope dealer speaks words that give life. 
And we want to be in that camp. We want to be those persons so that we can be in that camp. Here's concern number three. People who are fault finders think that they are hope dealers. They deceive themselves. What you'll hear that person say is, well, they deserved it. Or they really are that way, so I'm just telling the truth. And and they alibi and they they cover up and and they they give themselves more and more permission uh, to be a a fault finder. We, We need to be those people who bring hope to people. People need hope. People need to know they're loved and they need to know that they can get hope from Jesus Christ. And we have to be the ones who bring that to them. Most people are are fault finders, and and every one of us have have a sin nature which causes us to look for what's wrong with something or someone. Now, if you are a fault finder, you're a lot like the Pharisees of the time of Jesus. The Pharisees were the the fault finders of of the country. They're the ones who walked around looking for what is wrong. Jesus comes to that same circumstance. See, the the Pharisee will point a finger and make an accusation. Jesus will come along, call sin a sin, but he, he says, now go and sin no more. You can get forgiveness from me. You can get restoration from me. You can get wholeness from me. You, you, you don't have to live your life like that anymore. The, the Pharisee won't let you be anything but a failure. Jesus won't let you be anything except victorious because we are more than conquerors in him. That's what Jesus wants us to know and understand. So, don't be a fault finder. Be a a hope dealer. Here's another question. Have you ever met a critical person that you want to be like? That person out there somewhere, you see this guy who's critical, judgmental, and you say, man, I want to be like you when I grow up. We don't, we don't do that. We, we, we really want to be people who live life right. The problem is so many times we don't know how to do that, and so we, we, we make some mistakes. But so, so to that question, I say personally, I have never met a critical person I wanted to be like or to even be around. We don't want to be around those kinds of people. They'll pull you down. Before you know it, you'll be doing what they do. And that, that is never, never good. Here, here is a concern number four. Without realizing it, we become fault finders. We live in this culture long enough, and we'll start looking at what's wrong, not what's right. And, and we look at the world. How many of you have said recently to yourself or out loud, man, our world is really changing. It's changing fast. It really is. We can say it about the United States. The United States is changing, and it's changing fast. And, and it's changing in a way that, that, in my opinion, is going to be the ruination of the greatest country in the world. Uh, that's another message. So, <laughs> so do you want to be a fault finder or a hope dealer? Let's take a look at uh, uh, this verse, Romans 15, verse 13. Uh, It's not in the, pull out your little note section if you find that. Romans 15, 13 says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. I, I, I want you to maybe catch a, 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 a glimpse of this, that we are, are, are hope dealers. It's almost like we're, is it up here? Okay. Uh, yeah, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power 
of the Holy Spirit. I, I, I love that, what, what that does in my mind when I read that you may overflow with hope. You see, a lot of times we go through life hopeless. We, we don't know what God's going to do. We don't know how we're going to get through that situation. And here what the Apostle Paul talked to, praying a very bold prayer. He said that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. How many of you know there's nothing more powerful than the Holy Spirit of God? It's true. And God can do all things, and he does all things well. Let me, let me just kind of uh, give you some of these metaphors of, of how the Bible describes Jesus. He is the bread of life. He is the living water. He is the good shepherd. He is the door. He is the living vine. He is the gate. He is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. See, he is all of that and more. That, that is the hope we have in Jesus Christ. That's why we know that to, if we follow Jesus, the hope we get will be more than enough to transform our lives, to, to turn us into the person that he wants us to be so that we can be a, a follower of his. Here's some more of it. Listen to this. First Timothy calls Jesus our hope. Titus calls Jesus the blessed hope. Peter called Jesus the living hope. Whoever or whenever someone sinned, the Pharisees would point their finger and they would make an accusation. Jesus would come and he would call sin, sin, and but he would offer hope to walk away from the bondages of sin. He says you can go, but don't be uh, don't sin anymore, because in me you find forgiveness of sin. So we have the ability to be cleansed, to be washed, to be restored, to be renewed, so that we can be who Jesus Christ wants us to be. I want to share just a brief story with you uh, that most of you don't know. If you would have asked Sally or myself, how many kids do you have? We would say four. But in real life, we have two biological children. But some years ago, we took two foster children into our home. Uh, the, uh, a boy and a girl. The boy was nine at the time. The girl was 12. Their dad had died. The mother was one of those people who just, she, they, she couldn't even manage her own life, let alone the wives uh, of these children. Because in that household, there were four kids. There were two boys, two girls. We took one of the boys and one of the, one of the girls. And here's what we did. The very first thing that we did, we, we told them that they were equal to us. Uh, to us, in our, as is our, our own children. We, we told them that they had all, all the rights of a son or daughter. And we worked really hard to make sure we treated them as equals. When, when Christmas time came around, we made certain that each of the kids got the same number of gifts. And we worked really hard at making certain that they got the, basically within pennies uh, the, the same dollar amount spent on them. And, we, and we, we, we told them that that's the same thing on their birthday. That the, the, you know that the human mind compares everything to everything. And so had we not done that, those, those two kids, especially maybe, would say, they don't really love me. They don't treat me like their own son. So that's why we did that. So that they would have a running chance to, to find themselves accepted. What we discovered subsequently was that they had been in and out of foster care for who knows how long. The boy one day at dinner, after he'd been with us for about six months, 
whatever we were having for dinner, he particularly liked. And he, instead of just getting the bowl of say, spaghetti, instead of getting that bowl of spaghetti and putting it on his plate, he said, can I have some more? Like he was asking permission to have a meal. And we took that moment as a training moment. We said, Mike, you don't have to do that. You, if you want more, just take more. We got more, we can take more. You don't have to ask for permission for more. Now, if you're throwing it all over the room, that's another thing. But, but so we, we were very careful with that. We were careful that, that their, their chores inside the house and outside the house was equal. We, 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 we did everything that we could to, to tell them, to communicate to them that we loved them and they were valuable to us. Told them that our vacations were equal. Told them that our love for them was equal to our love for our own kids. And if we fast forward, we have the boy who's, we call him our two grandsons. We have that boy who's given us two grandsons. We have that girl who's given us two grandsons. Uh, to this day, we spend time together with them, uh, holidays and birthdays and other times. One of the things I love about uh, uh, the boy is he calls us. He doesn't wait for us to call. He calls us and says, hey, uh, what, what about Sunday afternoon? Do you want to go to dinner? So we say, yeah, that'd be great. We'll meet you there. And then he pays for it. You know, we don't, I, 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 lately, I've been kind of slow with my arm. <laughs> you know? uh, but when, when the waitress brings the ticket, he gets it and he puts it over here. That's his intention. He wants to bless us because we blessed him. We made a difference in his life. That boy at nine years of age was a problem looking for a place to happen. Had we not been involved or someone like us, uh, he'd probably be in prison today. See, the, that is the power of words of acceptance. And, and did we correct him? Yes. But we didn't criticize him. We, we corrected. We, we spoke words that helped them grow into young adults who have their own families. It's just delightful. So uh, that's the power of the words that we speak. And that's what we can understand. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish this by just sharing with you some more definitions of who Jesus is. Because Jesus is the difference maker. Let's stand together as I say these words. Who are we? We are people of God. We are hope dealers. We point people to Jesus, the living hope. We point people to Jesus, the King of kings. We point people to Jesus, the one who forgives brokenness and heals all infirmities. We point pe people to Jesus, our Savior, our King, our Lord. We point people to hope. We are not fault finders. See, anyone can be a fault finder. It takes a special individual, one who wants to make a difference in people's <laughs> lives to become a, a, a hope defender or hope dealer. And that's why my charge to you today is make the decision that you're not going to allow any unwholesome word come out of your mouth, that you're going to speak words of life. Do you know that, that and, I, and I said it earlier, we, we sometimes criticize someone for who they are, what they do, in the hopes that they would change, but they won't change as long as they're protecting who they are. When, when, when you show a person that you have 
uh, unbiased confidence in them and hope in them and favor in them, then they'll, then, then they'll hear what you're saying. And it's, it's almost like they'll say, uh, you know what I've been thinking? I think that this attitude that I've had has got me in trouble, and I'm going to change that. And, and we want to say, duh, uh, but we, <laughs> we, we don't. We just say, wow, what an insight. Well, that's incredible that, you, that you've come up with that. So that when, when you accept people, they'll change so that they can grow. That's why we need to make certain we don't criticize, but we instruct. I, I told the story in, in first service, and I'll just quickly tell you this. One day, I, I learned this, that, you, that we have to uh, accept the way people are before we can change them to what they should become. One day, Sally and I were driving. She was driving the car, and, and, and she was in the slow lane, and, but she had the cruise control on. And, and uh, of course, I'm sitting in the passenger saying, what in the world is she doing? I mean, this is crazy. But, but uh, don't tell her I said that. Uh, <laughs> so she had to break every once in a while because her, her, her uh, cruise control was faster than the, the guys in the slow department or slow lane were going. And so finally I said, if I were driving, <laughs> I would get out of this lane and, and, and then when I wanted to engage or disengage the cruise control, I would just do it right here you know, on the steering wheel, boom, boom. You don't have to brake and then you have to reset it. And, and, uh, and Sally said a statement that changed my life. Well, that didn't change my life, but that, that helped me understand accepting people. She said, well, when you drive, you can do it your way. When I drive, I'll do it my way. So we've got to accept people the way they are. I mean, every one of us have someone in our life, and there's something that, that probably irritates us about what they do. Accept them for the way they are, and they'll change. <coughs> Father, we come before you and give you praise. We give you thanks. Thank you, Lord, that you have instructed us, Lord, to let no unwholesome word come out of our mouth. Lord, in other places, you said that we are to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Lord, Holy Spirit, would you help us become men and women who walk that out, that people will see us and they'll say, there goes a, a born-again, going-to-heaven kind of Christian. Look at them. They are loving people wherever they go. Holy Spirit, would you help us be people who accept others so we can speak into their life so they can become the person that you've designed them to be. And we'll give you all praise for that. And Lord, we ask for your anointing. We ask for your blessing on this offering. We thank you, Lord, that you have good things in store for each one of us. And we give you thanks for that. In Jesus' name, everyone said? Amen. Amen.
Father God, I just thank you, Lord, for this day, Lord. I also thank you that I know that I can be a hope dealer, Lord, and not a fault finder. Father, thank you for teaching us that, Lord, that we need to watch our big, fat mouths. And we love you, and it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Hug somebody on the way out. Like a covenant of all Your love is enduring